Steel, you are watching Classic TV here on Wayback Machine 1. Tell your friends. Thanks. Hi, we have the classic TV shows from the Beverly Hillbillies to Dean Martin and Jerry Lewis. Classic movies from Laurel and Hardy to Boris Karloff. All for free here on Wayback Machine 1. Subscribe today. Thanks. Wayback Machine 1. Your Life, America's most talked about program, brought to you by Mr. This Is Your Life himself, Ralph Edwards. Don't go away tonight, I warn you, don't leave the set. This is going to be terrific. Hello, everybody. Thanks for joining us again on This Is Your Life. Now, tonight we have a startling surprise in store for you. Now, listen to this. We're going to recreate not one, but two lives. Wait till you see who they are. Now, right now, our two subjects are in room 205 of the Hollywood Knickerbocker Hotel. That's just a short block from here, just behind our theater, as a matter of fact. And they're talking to a friend of theirs, one of England's most prominent producers, Mr. Bernard Delphoff of London, whom we brought here to Hollywood just to make our surprise work. Now, listen, we have a television camera hidden behind French doors in the kitchenette, you see, of the hotel suite over there. Now, on my signal, the door uh, will fly open. The doors will go open, the lights will go on, the uh, speaker will go on so they can hear, and, well, you'll see what happens. Okay. All right, now, everything ready? Well, we can take it away. Camera number five in the kitchenette <laughs> of suite 205 at the Hollywood Knickerbocker Hotel. Here we go. Mr. Stan Laurel, Mr. Oliver Hardy. Uh, the El Capitan Theater on Vine Street here in Hollywood. You're very good friends there, Mr. Bernard Delfont. Mr. Delfont, hello. Where are you? Yeah, there you are. And Mr. Ben Shipman. Hello, Mr. Shipman. Hello, yes, they have joined with us in this surprise tribute to one of the greatest comedy teams of our time. Two heads, two bodies, but one big laugh for over 30 years. Tonight, this is your life. <laughs> I should say these are your lives. Dan Laurel and Oliver Hardy. Laurel and Hardy! Now, Stan and Oliver, Laurel and Hardy, we have a wonderful evening planned for you. Please hurry downstairs. Come over to our theater stage. Uh, Mr. <laughs> Delphi, <laughs> how you doing, boys? <laughs> Fifty million of your fans are eager to see your lives unfold. Lives that have brought the blessing of laughter to a... <laughs> to a troubled world for some 35 years. <laughs> While we wait for Laurel and Hardy to arrive, well, anything can happen tonight. Ladies and gentlemen, we have another surprise for you. Our own Joanne Jordan singing a cute new song. Thank you, Bob Warren and Joanne Jordan. Now, this is the first time, ladies and gentlemen, we've ever brought you two lives at once. Whether we're going to bring them to you or not tonight, we don't know because they're, uh, they're due to arrive any second from the Hollywood Knickerbocker right behind us here. Uh, the lives of Stan Laurel and Oliver Hardy. And if you've just tuned in, stick around because from what's gone on beforehand, this is liable to be the greatest night that we've ever spent on This Is Your Life. We've had more fun preparing this program, I believe, than we have uh, any of the programs that we've uh, done. We even went to the trouble of bringing Mr. Bernard Delfont all the way from London, New York, here just to surprise these two uh, boys because uh, Mr. Ben Shipman, their manager and longtime friend, said, look, there's only one person, I think, who, uh, who will fool these two fellas or who's going to uh, command enough interest for them to get away from their home, their wives, long enough. Of course, they brought their wives down with them. You saw them there, and you're going to see them a little later. To get them away and uh, to fool them, that would be Mr. Delphi. And uh, so that's what we did. And I'm still talking. I'd like to say a, two, uh, a few words about Texas, you know. I mean, I have to talk for two minutes before these guys get here. No, seriously, uh, we have received more cooperation on this program than we have on uh, practically any program that we have done. Uh, we received cooperation on everyone. But on this, everybody loves Oliver and uh, uh, Stan Laurel and Oliver Hardy. For myself, this is sort of a, oh, I don't know, a little personal thing because I think those of us who are in the uh, in certain lines of uh, 
comedy. Uh, go back to another show that I have, why maybe some of the things uh, we learned pretty much from watching these fellas. I can remember in knee pants going down to the Grand Lake Theater in Oakland and, and watching. They uh, took a taxi, did they, boys? They in, uh, we timed this out before, and <laughs> I said, I can go. They're here? Oh, thank goodness, because that was my last ad lib. Here they come now, our two principal subjects, Stan Laurel and Oliver Hardy. I think I have been told. Oh, my. This is more than a two-reeler. Here they come. Welcome. Let him get a look at you coast to coast. You don't mind this trick we pulled on you? Good boy, this guy, Delphont and, uh, and Chip. And sit down over here. I think uh, you sit right over. <laughs> we had to go sit over there. Uh, Mr. Hardy over there. Stan Laurel right here, if you will. Please. Yes, no, right, right here. Oh, That's okay. it. No, over. <laughs> That's it. Snuggle. Are you going to be room for all three of you? Uh, two of you there? Yes, I, uh, I guess that's going to be fine. Okay. You know, we had it worked out. We thought we'd better put you in a car to get you around, but uh, then I know we run into a lot of trouble that way. We should have had you run it. Or maybe you did. I Boys, did. you did. All right. These are your lives. <laughs> well, that's familiar. It said that laughter is the highest gift of the gods. Well, sometime near the start of the 20th century, it came time for you to be born, Stan and Oliver, so laughter rolled down from the blue vault of the skies and broke into two parts. You, Stan Laurel, are the first half. You're born at uh, Ulverston in Lancashire, uh, England, right, Stan? And uh, your stage name is now Stan Laurel. What was your real name, Stan? You want to tell me? You want to tell me? My real name? Your real name? Jefferson. Jefferson, that's nice. Stanley. Stanley? Was your name before that? Oh, Arthur Stanley. <laughs> when English schoolmasters called the roll and came to the name of Arthur Stanley Jefferson, they seldom got an answer. Why was that? Uh, were you there all the time? Sometimes. You used to sort of like to skip school once in a while. Once in a while. Once in a while. And as you... What are you laughing at, Mr. Hardy, over here? <laughs> yeah. Oh, all right. As you grow up, <laughs> Father tried hard to get you uh, to learn the business end of the theater. That's right. Stan took tickets at the box office, but longed for the day when he could take a funny fall or say a funny line on the stage. Uh, the voice from your boyhood days, Stan. Uh, I don't know if you can guess whose voice it is. It's not. No. He was your childhood playmate, and he's flown here from England to surprise you. From North Shields, England, here's your friend, Mr. Roland Park. Roland Park! <laughs> And then Mr. Hardy over here, Rose. Yeah. So Stan longed to be a comedian from boyhood, did he, Mr. Park? That's right. I, I uh, remember his first chance on the stage uh, when his father had the Metropole Theater in Glasgow. Remember that, Stan? And uh, <coughs> Stan was there uh, doing his stuff. And uh, while he was parading up and down, there was a gentleman sitting right in the front of the stove. He kept looking at Stan, and Stan thought, I seem to know that face. Yeah. Who remember did you that? see sitting there, Stan? Who was that? Your father? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, <laughs> you make a fast exit, and the tailcoat got in the act too, didn't it, Mr. Park? Oh, yes. Stan had, uh, uh, you remember you buried your dad's coat, a uh, long tail coat, but far too big for him, you know. He's trailing along the ground there, and there was Stan walking along. He got his coat in there, pulled the coat right in two, and of course, later on, Stan, with the tails over one arm, and the rest over the other, had to march home. What happened when he got home? Heaven known to you. <laughs> well, right, thank Stan. you, Mr. Roland Park, for coming from England to tell us that Stan Laurel saved you as a boy comedian. You'll see him a little later. Well, shortly after you're born, Stanley, a similar event is taking place in the town of Harlem, Georgia, USA. <laughs> That face is unmistakable, isn't it? You haven't changed a bit. <laughs> Oliver Harding. <laughs> Thus, on January 18th, 1892, a full ten pounds of good humor and future laughter are born to Miss... Oh, I've forgotten the date. Yes, I think it was uh, uh, in there somewhere. No, it was 14 pounds. Oh, 14 pounds. Oh, I, I see, yes. Uh, <clears throat> That's what your mother said? Well, at any rate, uh, you are born to Mr. and Mrs. Oliver Hardy of Harlem, Georgia. Now, uh, Mr. Hardy, <laughs> what is your... Real first name. Norville. I didn't get it. Norville. N-O-R-V. Norville. Yes, sir. You are the youngest of five children. After your father's death, you adopt his first name. 
Now, most of your boyhood is spent in the town of Milledgeville, Georgia. And there, to support you children, your mother manages the Baldwin Hotel. And Orville and I always walked to school together. Instead of carrying my book, I carried his. So that he could sing and dance all the way there. Now, can you guess who that is, Orville? Ah, Allison. She was your first childhood sweetheart. In fact, another girl, Mary Horn, pulled her hair good and hard once over you. You knew her as Althea Miller. You haven't seen each other for 45 years. Here from Macon, Georgia, is your friend, Mrs. Althea Miller Horn. Come on, Althea. <laughs> yes, that's Mr. Laurel over there. Oliver was always happy and always singing as a... Is it, what'd you say? I said she's still busy. Isn't she there? And uh, uh, he was always happy and singing as a boy there in Milledgeville, wasn't he, Miss Horn? He always, always loved to sing, but he didn't like his singing lessons. Oh, yeah. His mother met his teacher one day and asked how his lessons were coming along. And she said he hadn't been in over a week. <laughs> <laughs> well, what else do you remember of his boyhood, uh, Alfred? I remember him as a very brave boy. In fact, he went into the Oconee River to save his brother Sam and drowned him. And he pulled him out, and he and Arthur Kim gave Arthur some respiration. Too late. He's been in the water. That's a pretty heroic thing for him to have done. Thinking of others before yourself is a habit you formed in earliest boyhood. Oliver Hardy. Thank you, Mrs. Althea Horn. You're going to see me later. <laughs> now, down, boys. <laughs> we return to your life, Dan Laurel. Your father encourages you to get you an engagement with Levy and Cardwell's juvenile pantomime. You're just 17. 1910, you tour America and here decide to remain to play in your own act in American Hoadville. One of Tan's acts was being a funny burglar. He got such howls of laughter, he was signed up for his first comedy movie. Now, do you recognize that voice, Mr. Laurel? You may not. He was technical advisor on one of your early movie comedies in 1922. He's now president of Pan American Television Corporation. Here's your good friend, Mr. Frank Faust. Frank Faust. <laughs> Look, uh, Frank, you remember a time when uh, Stan ran for his life in order to get a laugh in a movie, don't you, Mr. Well, Stan uh, had the courage to take the personal risk of it involved in a good comedy scene. But he encountered a bull one time with no, without any sense of humor. A bull? <laughs> yeah. We were making a uh, comedy take off on Ru Rudolph Valentino's Blood and Sand, and in the scene, Stan was supposed to let this bull chase him down the street. What was his name? In the, in the, in the... Rhubarb Vaselino. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and as it turned out, why, uh, by the time the camera started grinding, why the Stan, uh, bull caught up to Stan and off, almost killed him. <laughs> After the real scare was over, we gave him another fright just as a joke. How was that? About... Well, uh, we told him that the camera didn't get the picture and that the scene would have to be shot over oh. again. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Frank Powell. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you, Frank. Now, in a moment, we'll uh, find out what you were doing at this same period of time, Oliver Hardy, and we'll learn that you two might never have gotten together at all if it hadn't been for a leg of land. But right now, both of you can take a breather, and I know you want it, just for a moment while we turn our attention to Bob Warren. Thanks. <laughs> you know, uh, uh, Oliver Hardy just said the most wonderful thing. He says, the funny thing, I never missed your show here. And to think, he says, it sort of fills you up. You bet it does. Back to these are your lives. Stan Laurel and Oliver Hardy. <laughs> During your teenage years, you sing to illustrated slides, movie theater. Oliver, this leads to forming a quartet with three other round and hefty fellows. What name did you call your quartet? The 20th Century Four. Yes. And uh, 20th Century, was that the poundage or the... Uh, no, oh, I see. Well, 20th. combination. Yeah. Did you have another name like Half Ton of Harmony or something, was it? Yeah, called that. 1913 finds you in Jacksonville, Florida. Here his friends called him Bay because he never smoked, drank, nor said bad words. <laughs> <laughs> oh, me. Well, do <laughs> you recognize that voice, Bay? No, she, she used to uh, be a vocalist, too. 
Used to sing duets with you at the old Burbridge Hotel in Jacksonville. Here from her home Helen in, in Cincinnati, Ohio, is your friend of long ago, Margaret O'Connor. Now, Miss uh, Jane Zarata. Here she is. Over here. Mr. Laurel, Mr. Rada. Well, now, Margaret, Mr. Hardy made his first movies right there. How's the family? They swell, huh? Yeah. Uh, uh, she's tell me how many? Uh, seven, eight grandchildren. Eight grandchildren. Want... <laughs> Mr. Hardy made his first movies right there in Jacksonville, Florida, didn't he, Mr. Rada? Yes, and they were so new then, Mr. Edwards, that, uh... Babe was called upon to do an intoxicated scene and a, and a drink scene. And a couple of his Mason friends from the Masonic Lodge saw him reeling down the street. <laughs> of course, they didn't know it was a movie. The next day, they had poor Babe up on the car, but he had an awful lot of explaining. <laughs> well, thank you, Miss James Arata, Cincinnati, Ohio. <laughs> I know they did. You bet. But everybody loves you there. Well, by the mid 1920s, both of you are in Hollywood. Your path destined soon to cross at the Hal Roach studio. As Oliver and Norval Hardy tells it, a leg of lamb brought them together. <laughs> I don't know if you recognize that voice, Mr. Laurel or Mr. Hardy. Should at the time he was production supervisor at the Hal Roach Studios, and later he worked on your picture, now known the world over as the famous writer-director of Going My Way, Bells of St. Mary's, My Son John, many, many more great hits, your good friend, director Leo McCary. <laughs> Leo, how did a leg of lamb... Uh, sit down, Oliver, and we're going to get out of boys. How did a leg of lamb bring Laurel and Hardy together, eh? Well, uh, it seems that uh, Babe was uh, cooking a leg of lamb, and uh, for some reason, uh, he left his arm in the oven too long or something. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, he got it so badly blistered that uh, we had to cut down his part in the next picture, so we decided to put Stan in the picture, too, to bolster up the comedy, and... and uh, so when we saw the two of them on the screen together, we decided there's a real key. And from that time on, uh, really they like really went places, all on account of Hardy had a little lamb. <laughs> oh, and that was the beginning of these famous hats. Now, Leo, you know how to work these better than I. Give them to the boys. Uh, 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 oh, sure. Oliver, stand up, please, and just put them on. Uh, stand up, Hardy. <laughs> yeah, did he get the right one? I'm not sure. No, the, 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 oh, no, that, 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 that's the right one. No, no, there, no, that's the, no, I think there's the... <laughs> <laughs> oh, my. Look, uh, in your pictures, uh, babe, Stan always uh, gets you in trouble. Isn't that right, Mr. Hardy? Now, is there any parallel in real life, Leo? Well, um, yes, I remember once when Oliver got in trouble without any help from Stan. Yeah, well, how's that? Well, uh, we were shooting uh, a picture up on the... Uh, on, uh, uh, the two of them were, were building a uh, skyscraper, mm -hmm. and, uh, and they were up about uh, 40 feet from the ground. And uh, Stan was looked down, standing up in the girders, and he got quite panicky, and uh, Babe tried to quiet him, and yeah. he said, look, you don't have to worry, there's a safety platform about 15 feet under the scaffold. And Stan looked down, and he said, well, even the, the safety platform doesn't look safe to me. <laughs> and Babe tried to quiet him, he says, look, to show you that it's perfectly all right. He said, I'll, I'll show you, and he jumped off. Well, it wasn't safe. <laughs> <laughs> and... Uh, the platform slowed him down a little, but he fell 20 and then 20 more feet to the ground. Well, uh, I, I know that uh, those boys showed a great deal of courage, though, to do some of the stunts they used. Well, you know, um, as, a, as a matter of fact, I, I felt that Dave seemed to show more courage than Stan, <laughs> but he got hurt more often. <laughs> Thank you, Leo McCary. Yeah. Thank you very much. Uh, Well, from 1927 on, the world takes Laurel and Hardy to its heart. And picture after picture, you throw the spotlight of high comedy upon human existence. The whole world laughs with delight to see the two of you struggle with a heavy piano. Now, uh, maybe you can see it there in the film. It, it, it's uh, always Laurel who gets Hardy into trouble, as we'll see right now. See? Shown in this case from one of your early films. Oh, who was that? Oh, I thought that was Bob Warner. No. Whoops, there you are. <laughs> Films that are still to the light of all of us, now on television. Even more, New York credit, you're just as much loved behind the scenes by all your associates. I can truthfully say that it was as much fun to work on a Laurel Hardy picture as it was to see one. Now, another important voice in your past. Uh, do you recognize it, boys? 
so many fellas in your past, we could parade all of Hollywood and all the world by here. He was general manager of the Hal Road studio when you both came there and during the early years of your great success. Here from his home in Santa Maria, California, your friend, Mr. Warren Doan. Here's Warren. Mr. Doan, can you tell us whether or not Stan and Babe were as funny fellas off camera as they were on? Yes, they were, and that's why they were so well liked by all their crew. Yeah. Once we were hard at work making a, a very dangerous situation, they were working with a, making a scene with a lion. And the trainer told them that when a lion is about to give trouble, the color of his eyes will change from yellow to green. <laughs> uh, one of the boys uh, asked him, by the way, uh, why is your leg bandaged up? The trainer had to admit that the same lion a couple of days before had chewed it up. <laughs> we all admired them because they went ahead and made that scene even though it was actually dangerous. Well, you've been a team in fact as well as name. No one knows that story better than your longtime manager and partner, Mr. Ben Shipman. Ben, come on out here. Here's the coach of right here. <laughs> well, Mr. Shipman, Stan and Oliver. Is, yes. Well, thank you for all your help in fooling these boys. They've uh, been together longer than any comedy team in movies. Isn't it something like 300 films together? They made? That is right, sir. And the most enjoyable and most wonderful part about working with them has been to observe their extreme loyalty to one another and the desire to please one another and the desire to make each other successful. Oh, it's, it's been a wonderful experience. Thank you, Mr. Ben Shipman and Mr. Warren Doan. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Well, the years roll on. The 1930s. The 1940s, you keep turning out your clean, wholesome comedy. And during this time, neither of you realizes what an impact you're having on millions of people overseas. Until you undertake a tour of England and Europe in 1947. Stan and Oliver were completely unprepared for the explosion of joy and welcome that greeted them everywhere overseas. Now, this is, uh, someone... Crowd blocked the seats to catch just one itchy bitchy side of them. Someone you helped get started in movies. Uh, today, she's a great star in her own right in movies on the stage, radio, television, now in Hollywood making the Sam Goldwyn movie version of Guys and Dolls. Here is your grateful friend, lovely Vivian Blaine. Vivian Blaine, ladies and gentlemen. Well, Vivian, you were uh, in London last year uh, playing in Guys and Dolls when Stan and Oliver uh, made their, what was it, third tour of the British Isles, uh -huh. I think it was. Now, how did the people show their affection for Stan and Dave? Well, Ralph, they had a most astonishing way of showing their great love for Stan and Ollie, mm -hmm. as we all have. Yeah. As a matter of fact, uh, as the word got out that their ship was about to dock at Cold Ireland, yeah. the signal went around, all the schools were closed, and thousands of people were at the dock to meet them. And then, a most unusual and wonderful thing happened. The great Carol and bells of the cold cathedral began ringing. And this time it had nothing to do with a hymn or an anthem. This time those wonderful old bells were ringing the cuckoo song. How oh, about that? Thank you, Vivian Blaine. <laughs> Thanks, Vivian Blaine. That's good. All your success would have been meaningless without someone to share it with you. So let's bring to your side the two ladies who really knew how to keep our secret. Your wives. First, your wife, Lucille Oliver, Mrs. Hardy. There she is. Your wife, Edith, and Mrs. Laura. Edith, right there. Hello. Oh, and another happy surprise, Dan. Your uh, daughter, Lois, Mrs. Randy Brooks. And here's Lois. Oh, my. That's the daughter. These are your lives. You sit here, Stan. Mrs. Laurel, you sit right up there and daughter beside you. And you, uh, oh, yeah, Mrs. Hardy, is there room, dear? <laughs> he could sit on his lap, maybe. Well, your past gathering around you here, your fun and humor uh, have been a tonic for a troubled world. You've given joy to others, a tremendous privilege, which is its own reward. Now, in a moment, we'll take a look into your future. But first, here's Bob Warren with a word about Hazel Bishop. Uh, very much. Uh, let's look into your future, Stan Laurel and Oliver Hardy. Uh, tonight, it'll hold the happiness you deserve at a party in your honor at the Hollywood Roosevelt Hotel, where your out-of-town uh, friends have been staying. Now, each of you will receive a 16-millimeter sound film of tonight's program and a Bell & Howell sound projector. 
uh, for rerunning the film. To Mrs. Hardy and Mrs. Laurel, we have these uh, very beautiful uh, charm bracelets, 14 karat gold charm bracelets from uh, Marshall Jewelers, Fifth Avenue, New York, one for each of you, and cuff links commemorating this night and other nights in your life for you fellas. Now, Stan and Oliver, Hazel Bishop uh, uh, wants, as a lasting honor to your life, uh, arrange a bronze tablet placed beside the famed old water pool of where you were in and out of so much at the Hal Roach studio, naming it Lake Laurel and Hardy. And here to accept this plaque is your uh, good friend, president of Hal Roach Productions, Mr. Hal Roach Jr. Come on. <laughs> Hal Roach Jr. Let's go with the memories of the wonderful comedies you fellows have done. It'll be a pleasure to put up a permanent plaque to... It's a tribute to your oh, genius. Thanks, Hal. Now, fellas, all of the, your friends were flown here by TWA, Luxurious Constellation. They fly the finest on TWA, the airline that flies three quarters of the way around the world. Thanks. Till next week. Good night to you all. <laughs> Ralphie boy, what do you say we tell the folks out there in YouTube land all about Wayback Machine 1? Everybody already knows that Wayback Machine 1 is the greatest, Norton. Even the guys down at the bus station love it. If you're not already subscribed, you're nuts. So do it now, and away we go. Wayback Machine 1 Someone you helped get started in movies. Uh, today, she's a great star in her own right in movies on the stage, radio, television, now in Hollywood making the Sam Goldwyn movie version of Guys and Dolls. Here is your grateful friend, lovely Vivian Blaine. Vivian Blaine, ladies and gentlemen. Well, Vivian, you were uh, in London last year uh, playing in Guys and Dolls when Stan and Oliver uh, made their, what was it, third tour of the British Isles, uh -huh. I think it was. Now, how did the people show their affection for Stan and Dave? Well, Ralph, they had a most astonishing way of showing their great love for Stan and Ollie, mm -hmm. as we all have. Yeah. As a matter of fact, uh, as the word got out that their ship was about to dock at Cold Ireland, the signal went around, all the schools were closed, and thousands of people were at the dock to meet them. And then a most unusual and wonderful thing happened. The great carol and bells of the cold cathedral began ringing. And this time it had nothing to do with a hymn or an anthem. This time those wonderful old bells were ringing the cuckoo song. <laughs> How about that? Thank you, Vivian Blaine. <laughs> Thanks, Vivian Blaine. All your success would have been meaningless without someone to share it with you. So let's bring to your sides the two ladies who really knew how to keep our secrets, your wives. First, your wife, Lucille Oliver, Mrs. Hardy. There she is. There we are. <laughs> and your wife, Edith, and Mrs. Laura. <laughs> there, hello. Oh, and another happy surprise, Dan, your uh, daughter, Lois, Mrs. Randy Brooks. And here we go. That's the daughter. These are your lives. You sit here, Stan. Mrs. Laurel, you sit right up there and daughter beside you. And you, uh, uh yeah, Mrs. Hardy, is there room, dear? <laughs> he could sit on his lap, maybe. Well, your past gathering around you here, your fun and humor uh, have been a tonic for a troubled world. You've given joy to others, a tremendous privilege, which is its own reward. Now, in a moment, we'll take a look into your future, but first, here's Bob Warren with a word about Hazel Bishop. Uh, very much. Uh, let's look into your future, Stan Laurel and Oliver Hardy. Uh, tonight, it'll hold the happiness you deserve at a party in your honor at the Hollywood Roosevelt Hotel, where your out-of-town uh, friends have been staying. Now, each of you will receive a 16-millimeter sound film of tonight's program and a Bell and Howell sound projector uh, for rerunning the film. To Mrs. Hardy and Mrs. Laurel, we have these uh, very beautiful uh, charm bracelets, 14 karat gold charm bracelets from uh, Marshall Jewelers, Fifth Avenue, New York, one for each of you, and cuff links commemorating this night and other nights in your life for you fellas. Now, Stan and Oliver, Hazel Bishop uh, uh, wants, as a lasting honor to your life, uh, arrange a bronze tablet placed beside the famed old water pool of where you were in and out of so much at the Hal Roach studio, naming it Lake Laurel and Hardy. And here to accept this plaque is your uh, good friend, president of Hal Roach Productions, Mr. Hal Roach Jr. Come on. Hal Roach Studio, when you both came there and during the early years of your great success, 
Here from his home in Santa Maria, California, your friend, Mr. Warren Jones. Here's Warren. Mr. Jones, can you tell us whether or not Stan and Babe were as funny fellas off camera as they were on? Yes, they were, and that's why they were so well liked by all their crew. Yeah. Once we were hard at work making a you know, very dangerous situation, they were working with a making a scene with a lion, and the trainer told them that when a lion is about to give trouble, the color of his eyes will change from yellow to green. <laughs> uh, one of the boys uh, asked him, by the way, uh, why is your leg bandaged up? The trainer had to admit that the same lion a couple of days before had chewed it up. <laughs> we all admired them because they went ahead and made that scene, even though it was actually dangerous. Well, you've been a team in fact as well as name. No one knows that story better than your longtime manager and partner, Mr. Ben Shipman. Ben, come on out here. Here's the coach of right here. <laughs> Mr. Shipman, Stan and Oliver. Yes. Well, thank you for all your help in fooling these boys. They've uh, been together longer than any comedy team in movies. Is it something like 300 films together? That is right, sir. And the most enjoyable, the most wonderful part about working with them has been to observe their extreme loyalty to one another and the desire to please one another and the desire to make each other successful. Oh, wow. It's been a wonderful experience. Thank you, Mr. Ben Shipman and Mr. Warren Doan. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Well, the years roll on. The 1930s. The 1940s, you keep turning out your clean, wholesome comedy. And during this time, neither of you realizes what an impact you're having on millions of people overseas. Until you undertake a tour of England and Europe in 1947. Dan and Oliver were completely unprepared for the explosion of joy and welcome that greeted them everywhere overseas. Now, this, uh, someone... The crowd blocked the streets to catch just one itchy bitchy side of them. Someone you helped get started in movies. Uh, today, she's a great star in her own right in movies on the stage, radio, television, now in Hollywood making the Sam Goldwyn movie version of Guys and Dolls. Here is your grateful friend, lovely Vivian Blaine. Vivian Blaine, ladies and gentlemen. Well, Vivian, you were uh, in London last year uh, playing in Guys and Dolls when Stan and Oliver... Uh, made their, what was it, third tour of the pretty Cops, uh -huh. I think it was. Now, how did the people show their affection for Stan and Babe? Well, Ralph, they had a most astonishing way of showing their great love for Stan and Ollie, mm -hmm. as we all have. Yeah. As a matter of fact, uh, as the word got out that their ship was about to dock at Cold Ireland, yeah. the signal went around, all the schools were closed, and thousands... Only one person, I think, who... Uh, who will fool these two fellas or who's going to uh, command enough interest for them to get away from their home, their wives, long enough. Of course, they brought their wives down with them. You saw them there, and you're going to see them a little later. To get them away and uh, to fool them, that would be Mr. Delphi. And uh, so that's what we did. And I'm still talking. I'd like to say a, two, uh, a few words about touches, you know. I mean, I have to talk for two minutes before these guys get here. No, seriously, uh, we have received more cooperation on this program than we have on uh, practically any program that we have done. Uh, we received the cooperation on everyone. But on this, everybody loves Oliver and uh, uh, Stan Laurel and Oliver Hardy. For myself, this is sort of a, oh, I don't know, a little personal thing because I think those of us who are in the uh, in certain lines of uh, comedy, uh, go back to another show that I have, why maybe some of the things uh, we learned pretty much from watching these fellas, I can remember in knee pants going down to the Grand Lake Theater in Oakland and, and watching. They uh, took a taxi, did they, boy? They in, uh, we timed this out before, and <laughs> I said, I can go. They're here? Oh, thank goodness, because that was my last ad lib. Here they come now, our two principal subjects, Stan Laurel and Oliver Hardy. I think I have been told. Oh, my. This is more than a two-reeler. Here they come. Welcome. Let him get a look at you coast to coast. You don't mind this trick we pulled on you? Because, boy, this guy, Del Font and, uh, and Shipman, sit down over here. I think uh, you sit right over. <laughs> we had to go sit over there. Uh, Mr. Hardy over there, Stan Laurel, right here, if you will. Please. Yes, no, right, right here. Oh, That's it. No, over. <laughs> That's it. Snuggle. Are you going to be room for all three of you, uh, two of you there? Yes, I, uh, I guess that's going to be fine. Okay, 
You know, we had it worked out. We thought we'd better put you in a car to get you around, but uh, then I know we run into a lot of trouble that way. We should have had you run it. Or maybe you did. I Boys, so you did. All right. These are your lives. <laughs> Well, that's familiar. It said that laughter is the highest gift of the gods. Well, sometime near the start of the 20th century, it came time for you to be born, Stan and Oliver, so laughter rolled down from the blue vault of the skies and broke into two parts. You, Stan Laurel, are the first half. You're born at uh, Ulverston in Lancashire, uh, England, right, Stan? And uh, your stage name is now Stan Laurel. What was your real name, Stan? You want to tell me? You want to tell My me? My real name? Your real name. Jeff. Jeff, that's nice. Stan. Stanley, was your name before that? Arthur. Arthur Stanley. <laughs> when English schoolmasters called the roll and came to the name... Mr. Jones, can you tell us whether or not Stan and Babe were as funny fellas off camera as they were on? Yes, they were, and that's why they were so well liked by all their crew. Yeah. Once we were hard at work making a, a very dangerous situation, they were working with a making a scene with a lion. And the trainer told them that when a lion is about to give trouble, the color of his eyes will change from yellow to green. <laughs> uh, one of the boys uh, asked him, by the way, uh, why is your leg bandaged up? The trainer had to admit that the same lion a couple of days before had chewed it up. <laughs> we all admired them because they went ahead and made that scene, even though it was actually dangerous. Well, you've been a team in fact as well as name. No one knows that story better than your longtime manager and partner, Mr. Ben Shipman. Ben, come on out here. Here's the co right here. <laughs> well, Mr. Shipman, Stan and Oliver. Yes. Well, thank you for all your help in fooling these boys. They've uh, been together longer than any comedy team in movies. Isn't it something like 300 films together? They made? That is right, sir. And the most enjoyable, the most wonderful part about working with them has been to observe their extreme loyalty to one another and the desire to please one another and the desire to make each other successful. Oh, it's, it's been a wonderful experience. Thank you, Mr. Ben Shipman and Mr. Warren Doan. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Well, the years roll on. The 1930s, the 1940s, you keep turning out your clean, wholesome comedy. And during this time, neither of you realizes what an impact you're having on millions of people overseas. Until you undertake a tour of England and Europe in 1947. Stan and Oliver were completely unprepared for the explosion of joy and welcome that greeted them everywhere overseas. Now, this is, uh, someone... Crowd blocked the streets to catch just one itchy bitchy side of them. Someone you helped get started in movies. Uh, today, she's a great star in her own right in movies on the stage, radio, television... Now in Hollywood, making the Sam Goldwyn movie version of Guys and Dolls, here is your grateful friend, lovely Vivian Blaine. Vivian Blaine, ladies and gentlemen. Well, Vivian, you were uh, in London last year uh, playing in Guys and Dolls when Stan and Oliver uh, made their, what was it, third tour of the British Isles, uh -huh. I think it was. Now, how did the people show their affection for Stan and Dave? Well, Ralph, they had a most astonishing way of showing their great love for Stan and Ollie, mm -hmm. as we all have. Yep. As a matter of fact, uh, as the word got out that their ship was about to dock at Cold Ireland, yes. the signal went around, all the schools were closed, and thousands of people were at the dock to meet them. And then a most unusual and wonderful thing happened. The great Carolyn bells of the Cold Cathedral began ringing. And this time it had no... Come on, Ollie. Yes, that's Mr. Laurel over there. Oliver was always happy and always singing as a, as a, what'd you say? <laughs> She's still busy. Isn't she there? And uh, uh, he was always happy and singing as a boy there in Milledgeville, wasn't he, Miss Moore? He always, always loved to sing, but he didn't like his singing lessons. Oh, yeah. His mother met his teacher one day and asked how his lessons were coming along. And she said he hadn't been in over a week. <laughs> <laughs> well, what else do you remember of his boyhood, uh, Alfie? I remember him as a very brave boy. In fact, he went into the Oconee River to save his brother Sam from drowning. And he pulled him out. He and Arthur Sam gave Arthur to respiration. Too late. He's been in the water. That's a pretty heroic thing for him to have done. Thinking of others before yourself is a habit you formed in earliest boyhood. Oliver Hardy. Thank you, Mrs. Althea Horn. You're going to see me later. <laughs> And 
now, sound boys, <laughs> we return to your life, Stan Laurel. Your father encourages you to get you an engagement with Levy and Cardwell's juvenile pantomime. You're just 17. 1910, you tour America and here decide to remain to play in your own act in American vaudeville. One of Stan's acts was being a funny burglar. He got such howls of laughter, he was signed up for his first comedy movie. Now, do you recognize that voice, Mr. Laurel? You may not. He was technical advisor on one of your early movie comedies in 1922. He's now president of Pan American Television Corporation. Here's your good friend, Mr. Frank Faust. Frank Faust. Look, uh, Frank, you remember a time when uh, Stan ran for his life in order to get a laugh in a movie, don't you? Huh? Well, Stan uh, had the courage to take the personal risk of it. Involved a, a good comedy scene, but he encountered a bull one time with no, without any sense of humor. A bull? <laughs> yeah. We were making a uh, comedy takeoff on Ru Rudolph Valentino's Blood and Sand, and in the scene, Stan was supposed to let this bull chase him down the street. What was his name? In the, in the, in the... Rhubarb Vaselino. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and as it turned out, why, uh, by the time the camera started grinding, why the Stan, uh, bull caught up to Stan and off, almost killed him. <laughs> After the real scare was over, we gave him another fright just as a joke. How was that? About... Well, uh, we told him that the camera didn't get the picture and that the scene would have to be shot over oh. again. <laughs> Thank you, Frank Faust. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you, Frank. Now, in a moment, we'll uh, find out what you were doing at this same period of time, uh, playing in Guys and Dolls, when Stan and Oliver uh, made their, what was it, third tour of the pretty Child, uh -huh. I think it was. Now, how did the people show their affection for Stan and Dave? Well, Ralph, they had a most astonishing way of showing their great love for Stan and Ollie, mm -hmm. as we all have. Yes. As a matter of fact, uh, as the word got out that their ship was about to dock at Cold Ireland. The signal went around, all the schools were closed, and thousands of people were at the dock to meet them. And then a most unusual and wonderful thing happened. The great Carolyn bells of the Cold Cathedral began ringing. And this time it had nothing to do with a hymn or an anthem. This time, those wonderful old bells were ringing the cuckoo song. Oh, about that. Thank you, Vivian Blaine. Thanks, Vivian Blaine. All your success would have been meaningless without someone to share it with you. So let's bring to your sides the two ladies who really knew how to keep our secret, your wives. First, your wife, Lucille Oliver, Mrs. Hardy. There she is. There we are. <laughs> and your wife, Edith, and Mrs. Laura. Another happy surprise, Dan. Your uh, daughter, Lois, Mrs. Randy Brooks. And here we go. Oh, my. That's the daughter. These are your lives. You sit here, Dan. Mrs. Laurel, you sit right up there and daughter beside you. And you, uh, uh yeah, Mrs. Hardy, is there room, dear? <laughs> you can sit on his lap, maybe. Well, your past gathering around you here, your fun and humor uh, have been a tonic for a troubled world. You've given joy to others, a tremendous privilege, which is its own reward. Now, in a moment, we'll take a look into your future, but first, here's Bob Warren with a word about Hazel Bishop. Uh, very much. Uh, let's look into your future, Stan Laurel and Oliver Hardy. Uh, tonight, it'll hold the happiness you deserve at a party in your honor at the Hollywood Roosevelt Hotel, where your out-of-town uh, friends have been staying. Now, each of you will receive a 16-millimeter sound film of tonight's program and a Bell and Howell sound projector uh, for rerunning the film. To Mrs. Hardy and Mrs. Laurel, we have these uh, very beautiful uh, charm bracelets, 14 karat gold charm bracelets from uh, Marshall Jewelers, Fifth Avenue, New York, one for each of you, and cuff links commemorating this night and other nights in your life for you fellas. Now, Stan and Oliver, Hazel Bishop uh, uh, wants as a lasting honor to your life, uh, arrange a bronze tablet placed beside the famed old water pool of where you were in and out of so much at the Hal Roach studio, naming it Lake Laurel and Hardy. And here to accept this plaque is your uh, good friend, president of Hal Roach Productions, Mr. Hal Roach, Jr. Come on. <laughs> Hal Roach, Jr. Thank you, still with the memories of the wonderful comedies you fellows have done. It'll be a pleasure to put up a firm of plaque to... It's a tribute to your oh, genius. Thanks, Hal. Now, fellas, all of the, your friends were flown here by TWA, luxurious constellation. They fly the finest on TWA, the airline that flies three-quarters of the way around the world. Thanks. Till next week, good night.